Right. We're vaguely going now until Zuhar time, okay? And lunch time. So we'll see how we get on. We're going to switch now. So try and get a new page in your heads. And now we're going to look at the New Testament. Now, the New Testament is the scripture which is specific to Christians. In other words, the Jews don't touch it. These are Christian writings. Secondly, the only scripture that the authors of the New Testament knew was the Old Testament. Okay? So they are writing about the faith of the early Christian community. And I'll explain in different ways how they're doing that. But when they talk about scripture, as scripture says, that's the Old Testament. Because that's the only thing that is accepted during this first century as scripture. It, it's only into the second century that Christians begin to say, well now, these gospels that these guys have written, they ought to be put, as it were, on the same shelf as the Old Testament. So that's when we start to talk about Old and New Testament. But we're going to, first of all, we've got to get them born before they can grow up and walk. So what happens then? Um, the Christian community, or rather the Jews who walked around with Jesus, experienced him. They experienced his teaching, the things that he did, the things that he said, how he was, and they said, how do we make sense of all this? And the how do we make sense of all this is a growing understanding that we are no longer Jews, but we're now Christians. So we've got what we call the parting of the ways. Um, how is it that we are following Jesus and therefore Remember, they're not called Christians until much later. They're called the followers of the way of Jesus. So how is it that we're following Jesus instead of following the Jewish ways of our forefathers? So what are the break points? And that's something that we're going to look at in more detail this afternoon when we come on to trying to talk about Jesus. Where are the break points that separate us out, the parting of the ways? Secondly, it's not just the teachings of Jesus and the things he did when he's alive, but two fundamental events take place after the death of Jesus. The first is, he is resurrected from the dead. We could not find his body when we went to the tomb. How do we make sense of that? What's happened? Now, you can imagine that on one level, the <coughs> Jews have said, somebody came and stole his body. The <coughs> Romans have said, yeah, well, it was, you know, th this was grave robbers. Forget it. The believing community said, that doesn't quite square. Well, what is going on? And then they start to get experiences of Jesus appearing. He meets them. And of course, they're dead afraid to start with what's going on here. So they meet him again and again over a period of time, and they begin to understand the event of the resurrection. Now, that changes their perception, because we thought he was dead, and, and he isn't. And he's not pumped up. You know, the Quran talks about Jesus raising people from the dead. The Bible also talks about Jesus raising people from the dead. What he's doing there is raising people back to this life. It's what I call being pumped up. You can imagine, you're dead, you're buried, along comes Jesus, calls you out of the grave, and you're pumped up to come back to this life. And the first thing you say to Jesus is, I suppose you think that's funny, do you? 
Yeah? Because I went through that dying business once, and now you've called me back to this life and I have to die again. Yeah? So it's not that that we're talking about with Jesus. Because their experience of him is that he's not the pumped up man anymore. He's living now a completely new life. The second experience that completely changes their life, you can imagine. You have spent a period of months or years following Jesus, thinking that he was going to revolutionize the whole game, and then he's captured by the authorities, and you think, don't worry, he'll, he'll escape, and he's executed. And your first thought is, well, they'll come for me next week. You know, they're going to clear us all out after this. That's what, you know, that's what we would do in modern warfare terms. Clear them out. So what they do is then, they're so afraid, they lock themselves up in a room, and they bar all the doors and windows, and they say, well, let's hope we're safe in here. And then something happens that completely changes their perspective completely changes their view and a kind of power comes upon them that enables them to, as it were, break out through the doors and windows and go and proclaim the message in the marketplace. We call that the day of Pentecost. So you've got these events standing behind the writing of the New Testament. So it's not just the teaching and the life of Jesus, it's also making sense of his death and resurrection to what Christians come to call eternal life, as opposed to being pumped up to this life. And thirdly, this unleashing of this power on the day of Pentecost. How do you make sense of all that? And that's part of what's going on here. So... The first thing the early Christian community do in the first few 20 years, let's say, after the time of Jesus, is that first of all they continue to meet in the, Jew in the Jewish temple and then they gradually break from Jewish practice, they break from synagogue meeting and they start meeting on their own. And when they meet on their own, they not only read the scripture, the Old Testament, but they also start to compose hymns of their own that try to express their faith. So the first writings that we can call Christian writings are these early hymns. And this is coming around the years 30 to 50. We don't know exactly when. There aren't many of them, but there are quite a few. And they're important because they are the earliest capture of an expression of Christian faith. And then onto the scene comes a guy called... Well, they're often incorporated. They're never there on their own. But Well, some of them are included in, in letters... Some of them are included in the Gospels, more in the letters, and you get formulas, you know? Um, you, you, get, you, you don't just say, you know, uh, you don't just say blessings of God, yeah? you say barakat Allah, so you get a formula which then, you know, comes into all your discourse. So after that, every time you want to say blessings of God, you'll say, Barakut Allah. So the same thing happens, that you get formulas at this period, which are then woven into all the stories later on. But these are, as it were, the first deposits. Now, we identify them, scripture scholars identify them by... You know, you can tell from the literary form. If suddenly somebody starts copying out the words of a hymn or a song or a poem or something, it breaks into the run and the flow of the rest of the text. So that's the way that you identify them. In which language? Uh, Greek. 
And that's important because the whole of the New Testament is written in Greek. Jesus does not speak Greek. Jesus speaks Aramaic. So when we come to the Gospels, we'll examine how we get from the lips of Jesus. But before we get there, the first formal lot of writings are a group of letters written by a man called Paul. Now this Paul is a Jew. He is uh, assigned to, to hound the early Christians, to persecute them, capture them, bring them back, and have them put on trial as heretics. And something happens in his life. And the way it's told is that he's on his way to Damascus, a blinding flash of light, as it were, hits him, strikes him from his horse, um, he's blinded, and he's told, go into the town, I will send somebody to you, and, um, you know, and then things will become clearer. So this is the first bit of his conversion experience, in which he changes from being a persecutor of Christians to becoming, we can say, the, the first real theologian of Christian faith and writing. Now this conversion takes place around about the year 33, 36, about that period. Jesus is dead. Paul never meets Jesus. So the question is, where does he get it all from? Because he hasn't got it directly from Jesus. After his conversion, he then you know, has his sight restored through a Christian who is sent to him. And then he goes off into the Arabian desert for a period of a few years. And at this stage, he is trying to work out the experience that he's had, how you square it with the scripture that he knows, which is the, the Jewish scripture, the Old Testament, and what this means about Christian faith. And then he starts interacting with Christians, hearing from them about their faith journey, about what they know about the teaching of Jesus, and he starts building and refining his understanding of Christianity. He then understands himself to be a kind of dai. You know, he's a missionary. He goes off to take the word to people. He goes off proclaiming the message. Now, gospel means good news. So he is going to proclaim the good news in all these different communities, in Greek, Greek-speaking communities. Many of them have Greek-speaking Jews, but most of the people who listen to him are what we would call pagans. They are followers of ancient Greek religious traditions. You know, they could be worshipping the Greek gods, they could be worshipping the emperor, whatever. And his job is to try and proclaim that message to them, to try to explain to them what Christianity is all about. And he does that by writing letters. Now, often these letters are responses. You know, hey, Paul, tell us something about the Christian faith. And he writes them a letter. Or somebody else comes and says, hey, Paul, we've got a whole load of problems going on here. You know, we've got people who we've screwed up the idea of marriage. We've screwed up the idea of sharing. We've screwed up the idea of, um, of eating so that we all have enough, etc. So you've got a whole list of problems. And he then sits down and writes a letter going through the catalogue of problems. We have, well, we have a total of 13 letters in the New Testament attached to the name of Paul. Now, New Testament scholars will accept 
seven of them as being authentically coming from Paul. So seven out of the 13 are authentically coming from Paul. And they're written between the year 50 and the year 61, about, maybe 62, 3. But that sort of period. So these are the earliest Christian writings, 20 plus years after the death of Jesus, written by a man who never met Jesus, and who is receiving divine inspiration and guidance, who is processing this new message against the Old Testament message, who is addressing people and their problems. Now, every teacher knows that when you're asked a question, this is a creative moment. How are you going to put together the answer? So that in the same way, Paul is asked things and he's working it out in response to the question. Um, he is steeped in the Jewish scriptures. His Christianity has come through a profound experience rather than through preaching. And he's had this time in the desert before he goes and engages with Christians and starts to drink in their, their wisdom, their teaching, their experience, and so on. And these letters are addressed to a particular group. He writes to the people of Galatia, one of the, of the little towns in Asia Minor. Now, very soon he's realizing that other people are reading these letters. So he writes to you, and he addresses the letter to you, and you are supposed to take it along to the Sunday congregation and read it to the people. So they're never private letters, but then he realizes that people are copying them and they're sending them to another community. Here, Mr. Paul gave us this stuff, now you can have a, a copy. So you're, you're sharing it around in this way. So you're getting a wider readership than just the people that Paul originally intended. Seven authentic letters, Two letters, the, the scholars dispute. Some scholars say, yes, add them in. Some say, well, for this, this, and this reason, not too sure. So they are disputed authorship. And then there are four others that are what we call coming from the community of Paul. Now, after Paul's death, or even before his death, somebody says to you, well, I know Paul isn't here, but you know what he would say. Why don't you answer these questions? Why don't you tell us? Now, if you tell us and you write at the bottom, you know, Fred Jones, well, Fred Jones doesn't necessarily have a lot of weight around here. So you put on the bottom, Paul. Well, hey, that, that ups the ante. That makes them more important. So this is what we call attributed to Paul. But they're coming from his community. So they're not coming off the wall. These aren't Beano writers. You know, they're coming from his community, responding, if he were here, this is what he'd say. So these are the, then the first 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. Pauline letters. Pause. Anybody want to jump in here? Yes, sir. Uh, could we have the machinery? Just a sec. Because otherwise, they'll think I'm making up the questions. Thank you. So, um, did, um, did Paul speak Greek? Yes. Or, okay. So, um, and did he receive divine revelations or inspirations from any higher power? He certainly didn't receive, as in Tanzil, text being sent down to him. But he does receive divine inspiration. Now, what this means then in Christian terms, different Christians will understand this differently. Some will take this in a very narrow sort of sense. It's as though 
God were guiding the hand that holds the pen that writes the words. And sometimes you will see ancient works of art, and there's the writer, and there's an angel sitting on the side, whispering into the ear. So it's that sort of... Now, that would be what we would call a literal, literalist school within Christianity. Others would say, um, no, that's too literal. Now, he is inspired, meaning he is divinely guided. God is at work in the process, guiding him to understand and communicate this message. Um, and in this way, the message is of a higher level to me writing, but it's not on the level of Tanzil, a text that's sent down to him. People would not accept that. Therefore, it's Paul who's doing the writing. Now that becomes important, you see, because he's a man. He's a man who lives at a certain time. He's a man who lives at a certain uh, culture, a certain atmosphere. So we get things there in which, you know, he's saying stuff about women, for example. Women should be silent in the assembly. Well, what kind of a man would write that sort of stuff? No, maybe it was a man who had had a bad experience. You know, his wife had boxed his ears once too often. And, and you know, and he says, well, okay, you know, uh, you know, women should be silent in the assembly. So you're constantly looking at the author, the man. Now, you're not looking at the author when you look at the Quran. You see the difference then with the direct divine revelation so we're constantly looking at the author and the context in which it was written. Go ahead. You want to come back? I, I was just thinking, so when you say divine revel, like he didn't receive a book, but yeah. he was inspired as in like the thoughts that he, would, that he would gain and then putting them into writing, did God sort of give him those thoughts that he wrote the letters or do you think not? It's, I think it's, it's not quite as mechanistic as that. Um, it is in the nature of human beings, whenever we have a profound experience, this experience always tries to formulate itself in some way. You know, I am deeply in love with my wife. Write me two pages to explain why you're in love with your wife. Not so easy but I know I am. But a profound experience has somehow to be articulated. Somehow it has to be expressed because it's not just for you, it's for others. So Paul's job is to express that and share it with others. So it's experience first of all, and then, you know, we've, surely we've all had that moment when suddenly something clicks. We say a light goes on. Aha! I know how I'll answer that. That's this kind of inspiration. Now we get that in teaspoons full and Paul gets it in buckets full. So it's that sort of thing that God is doing in, in the life, in the heart of Paul. But it's still a human author. He is not taking dictation from God. Therefore, why do we say, well, seven authentic, two maybe, four not? Because we're analyzing the text. And we're analyzing, um, you know, if I was to say to you, um, in the First World War, they made a great deal of use of drones in carrying reserves to the forces at the front line. Well, you know that could not be an authentic description because they didn't have drones. So if you've got something which is coming out of time sequence, can't be authentic. Must have been coming later. If you've got something which um, appears to be written from a completely different angle, well then, you know, you begin to question its authenticity. So this is what we call Critical reading, critical reflection, literary criticism. Criticizing the form of the literature. 
could we have some more machines, please? Oh. Just wait, so what language was uh, Paul's mother tongue? Greek. Like, why? Okay, was he Greek? No, like, but he was a Roman Greek. citizen. He was a Roman citizen. He's born in Tarsus, and Greek is the common language. Now, he would have learned Hebrew because he was an observant Jew, but his whole thought world is Greek. So it's a bit like English is today. Lots of people who are not born in England have English as their first language. Please. Um, I, I have a few um, disparaging opinions about, um, about Paul myself. Um, and the thing that I would like to perhaps um, point out for further discussion is um, the dream that, um, that Paul had, um, which uh, I think, to my mind anyway, um, sort of signposts the true parting of the ways. Um, and that is the dream where um, Paul had, uh, he, he had a vision of, um, uh, of unclean um, meats or pork or whatever it was, and then he heard a voice that said, apparently these, these meats are now um, uh, clean or, or permissible to eat. And um, this actually goes back to um, a disagreement that he had with Barnabas um, in that the two of them, well, Paul was of the opinion that um, he, uh, you know, uh, Jesus' message need to be um, put out to the Gentiles, that the Gentiles um, should, should be attracted or, or there were certain inducements necessary um, to make um, the, the uh, teachings of Jesus attractive to them. Um, and he was of the opinion that um, it would be quite difficult to get Gentiles to adopt a Jewish way of life and to give up certain things um, to which they were obviously accustomed. Um, and this was probably one of the, the, the biggest um, sort of differences, I suppose, and uh, possibly this could be what um, what Luke was referring to in Acts, um, that Barnabas and, and Paul had a, a falling out, and then they separated, um, and Barnabas took John Mark, uh, I believe, and uh, went to Cyprus, and the two of them never met again. Now, Barnabas obviously knew Jesus personally, and Perhaps his opinion would have been that Jesus would have never stood for this. Um, Jesus, being a practicing Jew, um, having you know followed the, te the, the law of Moses, um, never having touched unclean meats, um, being pure, and and, and so on. Um, and this obviously would have been a, a, a huge difference. Um, and and that's always my question: um, Did 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 Paul take? Christianity in the right direction. And, and obviously this had a massive uh, influence um, in the direction of Christianity. And I always ask myself, would Jesus recognize Christianity as, as the thing that he actually wanted or, or, or preached? Um, so it would be interesting to get your, your opinion on that. Okay, first of all, uh, we've got uh, a slight confusion at the heart of this. This dream of animals coming down and they're all declared clean, take and eat them. This isn't Paul, this is Peter. And that's fundamental to the rest of your discussion. Because what happens is that there is a, there's a tension. There's a tension within the early Christian community to what extent do converts to Christianity have to follow the observance of Jews? not just in terms of dietary observance, but also in terms, let's say, of male circumcision, um, of observance of the Sabbath, etc. To what extent do you have to, as it were, become a Jew in order to become a Christian? And the Jerusalem church, which was headed by Peter, this community in Jerusalem, were much more of the view that... Uh, uh, we're, as it were, we have a closer relationship with Jewish observance than 
Paul and his view, which is much more worldwide Greek, as it were. Now, the reason for that then becomes important because if anybody was going to say, well, this story of the dream and the thing was, um, was uh, a false experience, this is coming to Peter, and Peter's you know, deep into this Jewish observance group. Therefore, if he could have got out of it, he would have done. Uh, so that's one thing. Secondly, there is a big discussion that goes on to what extent is this a message only applicable to Jews and what extent is it applicable to all humankind. And um, there's, there's a tension in the early Christian community in the first few decades. In the early Christian community of these decades, there were lots of different groups. Some of them were much more observant of what we, we call them sometimes Jewish Christians. So they were wanting to keep a much closer Jewish way of life than others that we sometimes will call Greek Christians. Now the Greek Christians could also be Jewish background, like Paul. But they were, they had a wider focus as it were. And you're right in saying that Paul moves into that Greek-speaking diaspora, while Peter and James and, and uh, Jude, these guys uh, really are focusing on the Jerusalem-based Jewish Christian community. And that's one of those tensions. Uh, history shows that, as it were, the wide, worldwide focus is the one that, that proves to be right because the other one withers and dies. So there were various different groups in that early Jewish Christian school. Um, and Peter and the others recognize the authenticity of Paul's message, but they say, right, well, you go to that group over there and we'll go to this group over here. Um, I think it's, it's dangerous to... <clears throat> It's dangerous just because we have a, a name to associate that must be the same person. So Barnabas, for example, there are quite a lot of, of people around called Barnabas. Now, you know, he may or may not have been um, a direct disciple or uh, apostle of Jesus. Uh, but it's always a slightly problematic. Certain people were sure of and others well, somebody of that name was. It's a problem with, with early history. But you're right in saying that this is one of the fundamental factors in, um, in not following Jewish observance. And that keeps coming back into Christianity over the centuries. So we get, you know, the, the, in Britain we had the British Israelite movement of the 17th and 18th century who were wanting to go back to Jewish laws. Then we get the you know, Seventh-day Adventists today and so on. So it keeps coming back in history. It's one of those tensions with which we have to live. Please. If I remember it right, um, when Paul went to see Peter and the others, they actually... They wrestled with this, and they they then agreed as to the just a few limited things mm -hmm. that um, people um, coming to follow Christ needed to keep, rather than having to keep the whole Jewish law. Yes. Yeah. N not eating food sacrificed to idols, abstaining from blood, that kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. So there were there were certain basic agreements, and then after that, you know, you have a, a diversity. And there's diversity within the Christian community from the beginning, really. Just briefly going back to the divine revelation questions. Yep. Um, I mean, we, we learn in Scripture that God sp spoke from the heavens to, to Paul when he was converted. Yep. And he said, who are you? I'm Jesus, who you persecute. Yep. Uh, who you've persecuted. Now, is that myth <laughs> we don't know do we, we don't know but i mean there was that direct reportedly that direct revelation to peter to, well, to paul yes which, i mean there which was gave him a new 
direction in life. Yes, I mean that certainly, there is an experience there which he expresses in these words. Now, if you were standing there with a tape recorder, could you have recorded it? Uh, it would appear from, you know, from his own accounts that the others who were standing there didn't hear the voice. He heard it. Did they see a light or something? Well, I mean, certainly something happened, but it, it's an internal experience with which he, art he articulates it in this way. What actually happened, as it were, microphone-wise, God knows best. But the whole point is that his life is changed through this powerful experience. And then the experience has to work itself out in practice. Just a sec. The no, no, just, just, just. I'm sorry. There you go. No, please. Oh, wait, right. Um, the implication in the earlier question was that Jesus' message was exclusively Jewish. And, of course, there are plenty of proof texts that would support that. But are there not also plenty of hints in the, in the Gospels that Jesus' message was universal? Oh, there certainly are. But, I mean, it's important. See, Jesus is a human being. He is not a pre-programmed robot. Now, if I ask the question, Stephen Hawkins just died last week. The baby Stephen Hawkins lies in his cradle. Does he know the, the theory of the relativity of time? Does he know the theory of the radiation of the dark holes, etc.? No, he doesn't. Is he an imperfect Stephen Hawkins? No, he's not. He learns that in the process of his life and of his interaction. And what we see in the life of Jesus is a learning process. That Jesus is, as it were, learning on the job. Because Jesus is the recipient of this light. This, he is the, the word incarnate, you see. And he's coming to terms with that all the time himself. Uh, so there are times when he says, oh, no, I'm, I'm sent to the, to, to the lost people of the tribe of Israel. You know, not to you lot. And there are other times when he says, I've never met faith like this amongst the Jews. Um, I've got to go and rethink this. Amongst so, the Gentiles? Among, no, amongst the Jews. Because it's a Roman soldier, remember? The centurion. Oh, the Roman centurion. And he says, wait a minute. You know, pause for thought here. So you've got a learning process going on. Uh, and certainly the outcome of that process is, as far as Christians are concerned, this is a universal message from a universal Jesus and not a local tribal message for the Hebrew people. But it is that kind of outworking process. Yes, sir, have you got a machine? Quick question, sorry. Um, did Jesus himself make any reference uh, to Paul in, throughout his teachings to say that? No, no didn't know he existed. I mean, we assume he didn't know he existed, but I mean, certainly, um, they're, they're living in different countries, different times. Paul only comes on the scene after the death of Jesus. No. I mean, he's not saying, hey, listen, lads, wait until a guy called Paul comes along. There isn't a saying like that. So it's a different system, you see? Different system. Yes, sir? Have a machine. <coughs> So yeah, um, the divinity of Jesus, yeah. uh, does that come from Paul or before Paul? Keep breathing till after lunch. Okay. <laughs> because we haven't got there yet. Um, but we are, we are heading there um, after prayers for divine inspiration <laughs> and lunch. Um, yeah, let's not begin to address it until we, we do it properly, if that's okay. Right, so these are the earliest writings then. Now, the next group of writings, Gospels, the word Gospel means good news. So this is the good news lived, proclaimed by Jesus. 
So he is the gospel. He is the good news. So first of all, he is it, he lives it, he proclaims it, but then we've got a gap of some 40 years before the first writings of the Gospels of the New Testament. So what happens then? You could imagine, just as Prophet Muhammad is going around within the community, people believe that he is a prophet sent by God. They're kind of still working out what that might mean, but nevertheless, they accept him in this way. Well, it's beyond the realms of stupidity to think that they didn't take notice of what he said, that they didn't take notice of what he did. And so you have got the, the generation of sayings about what Muhammad said, about what he did, people are noticing. And you could imagine that you've been to the marketplace and you come home and the family all say, what did you get new today? What, what did you see the prophet do? What did you see him say? What did you hear him say? And so you've got this oral tradition building up of things that were said, things that were done, experiences that were had. The same then happens also with Jesus. So there's a bunch of people who are going around with Jesus. They, they see, they hear, they experience his life, his teaching, who he was, how he interacted with people. They experience the things that he did, the things that he said, his teaching, and they drink all this in and then they repeat it. Now, Jesus taught very often through the use of stories, parables. Now, a parable is not a nice story like, you know, a fairy tale or something. A parable is like a prophetic saying. It's supposed to spike you. It's supposed to really make you think. Now, if you get a saying that is, you know, really supposed to make you think, you tend to remember it, you tend to, it sticks in the memory, you pass it on to people. So we've got then the development of this oral tradition, as we say. So you've got a whole pool of sayings, accounts, teachings, actions, how Jesus was, what he lived like, and so on, which is, which is there in the early community. You don't have an isnard. That's a difference, but it's there within the community. So the community are the guardians of the teaching, the life, the being of Jesus. So when you get people who come to write a gospel, these gospels are, they're not historical accounts, as though you were sitting there like a war correspondent, they are theological accounts of the life and teaching of Jesus, the things he did, the things he said, drawing from this oral tradition, but putting it into a certain form in order to convey it to a certain group of people. Now, the way that you would convey that to a group of Palestinian Jews might be different from the way that you would convey that to a group of Greek-speaking non-Jews. So your target audience affects the way that you put the material. For example, if you're writing, if I was writing to Muslims, and I would say, you know, and the Prophet made wudu before his prayers. You all know what that means. If I'm writing to non-Muslims, I would say, and the prophet made a ritual washing before his prayers, which included the following, and this was the customary practice of the prophet and of his community afterwards, and then you'd carry on. So the, the target audience affects the, the way that you put the story. Right. If I was saying to you, um, 
when you build the new Salam Center, you're going to have to get in some really expert structural engineers to go down very deep and drive piles into the ground and then you'll have a solid foundation for your new building. That's a very 20, 21st century Western way of building buildings. If we were talking in an African village and we were saying, you know, in order to build your new mosque, you've got to lay a good foundation, we'd be talking about choosing the right piece of ground, making sure that it's well beaten down and well hammered before you, you start your building. Because the building techniques are very different. So what would happen is then Jesus gives an, an example. He says, you have got to lay firm foundations for your faith. Otherwise, it's not going to stand. So be like a builder. When he builds a house, he finds a good flat piece of ground and he builds his building on rock and not on sand. Now, this is not Architecture 101. This is how you are to found your faith. Now, I have to convey that message to another group of people. They don't build like that. They think I was off the wall if I went on like that, because they're not in Africa. They're in London, 21st century. Now, I've got to give the same message. So I say, when you're going to build a building of that sort, You've got to really dig down to solid bed bedrock and then you've got to sink piles into the rock and put in your reinforcing bars and then pour in your concrete and then you'll... But the message is exactly the same. Your faith must be founded on a solid foundation. Now, when the gospel writers come to write, they are writing to a particular audience. And if the message would be distorted, as it were, in the way that Jesus spoke it, if the message would be distorted, if you just copied it the same way to another audience, they change it. And the example I give about you know, laying a good foundation when you're building the foundations of faith is exactly a message that is contained in the Gospels Matthew writing to a Palestinian audience spins it one way. Luke writing to a Greek audience spins it another way. But the message is exactly the same. And what you're doing here is changing the actual words of Jesus in the Gospels. In order to keep the message the same. So you see, we're, we're not into the world of Tanzil here. We're not into the world of a text that drops from heaven. We're into the world of a text written by human beings under divine inspiration, working with the teaching of Jesus, written at a particular time to a particular people in a language that Jesus didn't speak. So always you're translating. Whatever Jesus said, you're choosing the best word in Greek to explain it. Please, can we get a microphone? Thank you, sir. Just one sec. Thank you. Um, so, I have a question. And so, if, so who are these people, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, that wrote the Gospels? Mm. Now that's, you know, that would make me a rich man. <laughs> um, these are names attached to those Gospels. The first thing. Secondly, notice 40, 45, anything up to 60 years, 70 years after the death of Jesus. So these are not eyewitness accounts. It's not necessarily clear at all that these authors actually were eyewitnesses to the Palestinian Jesus. You know, they'd have to live a long time if they were. May have been, we just don't know. Secondly, these are oral traditions that are gathered together. So the oral tradition may go right back to the lips of Jesus, but it's gone through decades of transmission first. Um, thirdly, these are 
edited and re-edited. So you've not necessarily got everything flowing from the same pen. Sometimes, you know, another bit might have been incorporated by somebody else. Um, we don't know. I mean, there are people, there is a guy called Mark who appears in one of the stories. Whether it's the same Mark or not, Allah wa alam. You know, there is a guy called Matthew. Whether it's the same Matthew or not, Allah wa alam. Uh, you know, we just, you know, there are things we don't know. So, they must have got their information from somewhere in yes. Hebrew or Aramaic, I take it. Yes. So, where are those original don't writings have them. and teachings? Don't have them. We have, we have a few writings that have been gathered together um, um, that would... We call them sayings of Jesus. So sometimes they're called sayings gospels. Now, you're talking a fairly small amount here. Um, and even so, they're tending to be written in Greek. Uh, so you've not got, you know, you've not got the, the, the reporter's notebook, as it were, or the policeman's notebook. So the community is the custodian of the message. That's the key. The, the community is the custodian of the message, not the reporter's notebook. Please. Sorry. Um, I, I believe that some scholars also um, believe that there was a, um, another source called Q, um, which was written in Koine Greek, apparently. Um, and those two um, were used by Matthew and Luke, if I'm not mistaken, um, to draw upon um, because very similar stories appear in both um, of those Gospels. Although I believe uh, Luke, um, Luke has more of them, I think. Um, I don't know if, because some, some scholars obviously dispute that they existed, um, and in fact we don't really know. I'm not sure what the latest thinking um, is of that. Uh, this term Q comes from the German word Quelle. Quelle means source. So uh, the, the scholars put forward the notion that there was a document which was in circulation, a written document, which they say is a source of stories and teachings about Jesus. This was one of the elements that were drawn on, especially by Matthew and Luke, in putting together their gospel. So, um, if we take Matthew, for example, when he sits down to write his gospel, he's got Mark on the table, Mark's gospel. He's got Q, this group of sayings from Jesus. He's also got other material, that has come to him in other ways, and he weaves that into the eventual Gospel of Matthew. The same is true of Luke. Luke certainly has Mark, he certainly has Q, uh, probably has Matthew. Uh, there's a, an argument, which may or may not be sustainable, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is one of his sources, because it's Luke that has the infancy stories, who knew those except the mother, as it were? Don't know, but it's, a, it, it's a, a one possibility. Um, so they have different sources in this way. Q is lost to us. We don't have it. Now, there were other earlier writings that are also lost. Some earlier writings are preserved. When we come to talk about, again, the forming of the canon, this authorized collection, there was more left out than was put in. So if I just, if I just show you, um, these documents that were left out on my shelf would form two thick volumes like that. And the ones that are put in would form one thin volume like that. Now, not surprisingly, you imagine you know, what do you know about Jesus before he starts his public ministry? Very, 
very little. Be nice to know, though, wouldn't it? You know, what, how was he at football? You know? Um, you know, what was he like as a lad growing up? You know, well, yes, all that kind. <laughs> so, I mean, so what happens is people start making up, the, you know, filling in the gaps, especially the early years. So, you know, infancy narratives, you know? I mean, Jesus must have been dead good when he was a lad, you know, playing in the river with the other boys and... And he makes, you know, he makes little models and so on. And, and you know, Jesus was, uh, Jesus was playing football with the other boys and somebody fouled him and he said, well, you drop dead. And he did. <laughs> and Jesus, mm, blimey, go on, get up again. And he did. You know, now you can see that that kind of stuff isn't, it's not authentic. Now, it may be that in the same document, you've got some authentic material. This is the work of scholars. This isn't the work of Mickey Mouse, you know? So scholars will sift through these early writings and they will say, no, we, you know, these obviously can't be accepted. But actually that, that's a really, you know, important contribution to the whole scholarly discussion. Please. Um, was this all decided finally at the um, First Council of Nicaea? Um, no, it was all decided over a period of time during the second and third centuries. Um, it is kind of formalized uh, in the fourth century. But um, the four Gospels, for example, are accepted in, certainly by the middle of the second century and the others are left out. But again, the key to the whole thing is, it is the faith of the early community which validates which is expressed. So it's not an isnard approach. It is saying this is what we believe, this is our faith. And that changes the dynamic when you're talking about inspiration, when you're talking about you know, ongoing development. The focus is on the community, not the pipeline by which you get the writing, the isnard. Please. Uh, okay, I think you partly touched on my question because I was trying to uh, see. Uh, th it seems the Gospels perhaps are rather akin to our Hadith, the Muslim compilations of Hadith. You think? Are there uh, similarities or differences? You think? Um, they share with the Hadith in containing elements of the the, the teaching of Jesus teaching of Muhammad. They are different to the Hadith in that they are human-authored theological writings. And so Mark, for example, starts, Jesus as an adult appears. Matthew gives us some genealogies because it, it's rooting him into the Palestinian Jewish context. Luke starts with, um, uh, with infancy narratives. You know, the, the, the conception of Jesus, Mary, and so on. John is a completely different game altogether. This fourth gospel is a much more theological text, whereas these three basically are taking the same body of material and they are conveying the faith of the community as expressed in that material from Jesus. Whereas John is much more theological. It's a theological writing. And again, uh, who John was, we just don't know. I mean, there are, you know, there are various theories put forward, but we just don't know. That's not the point. The point is, it's the community that authenticates the text. This is included, that's not. Uh, one other question is, um, you only mentioned the four Gospels, but uh, obviously I think there are, you said there, there were more than four. Oh yeah. Uh, and there's the Gospel of Barnabas. Uh, potentially. Potentially, yes, yeah. So what's your opinion on that? Ah. <laughs> uh, now. There, 
are lists from the early period of various Christian writings. Uh, we know of them, we gain, we gain knowledge about them because uh, they were read in the assembly. Uh, one of those was called the Epistle of Barnabas. So a document called the Epistle of Barnabas dates from a very early period. It is lost. Most of that stuff is lost. Some of it are in these volumes of, as it were, the stuff that didn't make it into the New Testament. Most of it is lost. First comment. Second comment. The document that is today referred to as the Gospel of Barnabas is first discovered in Holland in the 18th century in an, a Spanish translation, if my memory is correct, from an Italian original and it gets its way into the library of the royal household of Vienna which is where it is now. And this document, which is called the Gospel of Barnabas, recounts the basic gospel formula of these three, except that whenever they disagree with the Quranic perspective, it gives the Quranic answer. So it is as though it is using these, this material with a Quranic twist in order to reinforce the Quranic message. Now, therefore, some people have put forward the theory that maybe this is the missing Injil. Right. Uh, you will find this on... Anybody got one at home? Yeah, I mean, I've got three different editions. So I, What's Injil? Injil is the name given to the book given to Jesus according to the Quran. The Quran says Muhammad receives the Quran, Moses receives the Torah, Jesus receives the Injil. Now, what is this document? Don't know. If you ask me, no idea. We have no record of it. Some people have put forward the theory that maybe this Injil is preserved in this document called the Gospel of Barnabas. I am less than convinced. And the reasons for being less than convinced are, first, we have no history of this document right up until the 18th century, beginning of the 18th century. Where was it all the way through these centuries? Number two, um, if you do a linguistic, not you, you and me, but if you're a, a linguistic scholar, if you do a linguistic analysis of this text, which has been done, then the result is that it was written in medieval Italian, which is probably not what Jesus or Barnabas spoke. Thirdly, there are elements in the text that would um, mirror um, things like Dante's Inferno, uh, things like architectural design in Florence of that period, um, and it has some uh, variants with the, the Quranic story. Now, um, the body of scholarly opinion, certainly amongst non-Muslims, is that uh, this is a medieval forgery probably written in the, the 16th, early 17th century in medieval Italian. Um, clearly written by somebody who knew what were the contents of the Quran. Remember, the Quran is first translated into Latin, which is the language of medieval Europe, um, in 1132 by Richard of Ketton in Toledo. So it was entirely possible to know the contents of the Quran. And of course, what it does, it's kind of, it's a work of polemic. You know, if you, if you want to spike the Christian guns, you say, well, here's the real authentic gospel of Jesus, you see? Um, and that's fine, um, except I'm not convinced. 
And when I say I'm not convinced, well, certainly, um, not just Christian, but also Western linguistic scholars who've looked at it are not convinced either. I asked one of my, one of my colleagues, uh, I won't name him, but shall we say, I mean, one of the most senior Muslim scholars in the country, what do you think about the Gospel of Barnabas? And his answer was, any book that I am given that treats the Gospel of Barnabas seriously, I throw it in the bin because whoever wrote it must have been an idiot. Verbatim, as it were. So, um, the may, I mean, you know, the Quran says there was the Injil. No questions about that. That's fine. That's what the Quran says. Whether the Injil is the Gospel of Barnabas, as in this text, well, shall we say, at least the jury is out. I think the jury has come back and said it's not. But nevertheless, um, you know, it's a very interesting text. But again, it's widely distributed. You can find it in different editions, in different languages, because it, it, it's a feel-good factor. Oh, no? Hey, this is it. We've got the real Injil given to Jesus, and the Christians ain't got it. You know, and it doesn't have... I mean, every time that, you know, all the... the, the connect point of the... the um, all the points at which... The, the Quranic and the Christian stories differ. It, you know, they're crucial. They're not little things. So Jesus is not crucified to death according to the Gospel of Barnabas. Jesus announces in the Gospel of Barnabas, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait until Muhammad comes. Uh, Jesus calls together the lads and says, listen, there's nonsense being talked. People are saying, I'm the son of God. This is rubbish. So it, and these are really serious points. And if it was true, well, you've just cut the ground out from Christianity. So, you know, it's kind of important. So Steve. what do you mean by the, the community authenticates yep. the um, Gospels? By that, what I mean is somebody has got to say what gets into the New Testament and what doesn't. And you've got... Well, literally hundreds of early documents floating around. What are the criteria by which you make a judgment? First, they have to go back to the very earliest period, to what we call the apostolic age. They've got to go back way into the first century. Secondly, they've got to be widely accepted by Christians as being authentic. Um, and thirdly, there's got to be a, a continuity of, uh, of deposit, you know? You've got to have had the text around for a long time from the early period. That's, those are the criteria. Who's making the judgment? It's the Christian community. How do they do that? They do that through their leaders, their bishops, their scholars, sitting in a kind of solemn... Uh, council. And in this solemn council, they pray and invoke the guidance of God. They hammer out any points at which there are differences of, of understanding and agreement until they eventually end up with an agreement and they say, these 27 books get in, the others don't. That's what I mean by the community. Well, you may say that's guesswork. Um, I think that that's, first of all, that's the work of early scholarship. And secondly, it's the work of divine guidance. So there's a lot of competing interests. In oh, yes, yes, yes. <coughs> yeah, uh, I want to get my opinion about this. Yeah, yeah. Which is not very spiritual. Well, if you want to get your bit in, I mean, the likelihood is the rest of us are going to chuck you out, as it were. So you've got a refining process going on. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you can bribe them. I mean, look, at the end of the day, uh, faith and a body of faith is based around a believing community who are prepared to live their lives by it rather than um, some kind of uh, computer-generated database that that says this is or is not authentic. So it is the property of the community and they give it this position. 
Now, with good reason, I mean, the criteria are not a joke, and they research it very carefully, and they exclude much more than they include. But at the end of the day, it is the responsibility of the community through their leadership system. Now, you can imagine then that when the Quran says they've taken their priests and rabbis as lords before God, then you can see that, well, maybe this is an incident of it. Yep, you can see that argument as well. Please. Um, I just want to go back um, for a second to the Gospel of Barnabas, and I just wanted to note as well that the, the, the document itself is actually quite a large document. Um, it's perhaps, I would say, a lot longer than any of the other Gospels. And aside from, you know, sort of its positioning and trying to uh, have chronic answers and so on, um, that also there's a lot of new material um, which hasn't been seen elsewhere. Um, a lot of sayings, a lot of miracles, um, various things um, which as far as we know, there's sort of no other source for. Um, and yeah, I'm not really sure sort of what your opinion is on that or, or, or really where it comes from. Um, secondly, also be interested to find out your, um, more about the Dead Sea Scrolls mm. um, and, um, and this new uh, document which surfaced quite recently, which um, was uh, popular, popularly referred to as the Gospel of Judas. Mm. Um, yes, uh, I can't say much about the Gospel of Judas. These things are subject to kind of scholarly investigation. Let's see what they come up with. Dead Sea Scrolls are a whole lot of scrolls that date back to first century that were found in caves around the Dead Sea, preserved. Uh, they're nearly all of Jewish origin. Some of them come from the Essene group, that was a particular group amongst the Jews. Uh, some of them are the Essene spiritual writings, if you like, a bit like kind of Sufi texts. Uh, some of them are going back into the biblical period and scholars work with them and try and authenticate, draw out, correct, whatever they have. Um, as regards the, the other material in the Gospel of Barnabas, um, I, would, I would suggest that you've got a compilation of two things. One is, remember that there were lots of these other Gospels that didn't get in in the first place, but they exist. They're in libraries. So you draw on those to pad out your gospel. And secondly, you know, if in doubt, make up a good story that fits. So, you know, you can, you can do that as well. And that's not a pejorative statement, you know. Um, if Jesus were here, this is what he'd have said. You know, it's a, it's, it's a serious statement. Um, but I would not be able to see that that was an argument for early authorship or authenticity. I would see that as meaning that whoever wrote it was a pretty clued up individual with you know, access to a library. Okay. Um, the break, I mean, where? Sorry, I'm here. Sorry, I'm here. Lunch break thingy. Oh, talk about lunch it? break. Yes. Can we go for another few minutes yeah, sure. and then have lunch? Yeah. Can we manage another quarter of an hour? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Somebody calls the azan. I'll stop. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to say something about um, about this this pile down here before we finish, because. 4, 13, 17, you've got 10 missing. And these 10 down here that we, you know, group together under the heading of writings, these are, you know, different sorts of things. Um, some of them we call the Catholic epistles. Now, the word Catholic does not mean the church headed by the Pope. The word Catholic means universal. 
So just in the same way, the Sunnis are not the only people who follow the Sunnah. They've just hijacked the term. So the Catholic epistles, this Catholic means universal, worldwide, and epistle as opposed to letter, well, letters addressed to a particular individual, epistles are, have a much wider audience. And we've got then a whole collection of Catholic epistles, as we call them, attributed to individuals like Peter, James, Jude. Uh, these are um, perhaps some of them uh, can be traced back to early church authorship. Um, Peter is put forward as the author of 1 Peter, the first letter that bears his name. Um, but it's not written in fisherman's Greek, as it were. So, you know, he's got a scribe who's polished it up and improved on it. And often, you know, these are the questions that are sent up. You know, you send up a question to a marja and you get a response. So these are, you know, what do we do in this circumstance? These are these kind of questions. They're about correcting ways in which the early church has gone off astray to different ways. So that's this whole group that we call Catholic epistles. Then there's another, which is called the letter to the Hebrews. Um, now, this is very deeply couched in Jewish ritual terms. This is written to Jews who know about the life of the temple and so on. So Greek speaking Jews, Many Jews at this time were Greek speaking, and it's as it were, it's putting the message in Jewish terminology, Jewish style. It's to it's to recruit Jews to the to the fold, as it were. Uh, this one, the Acts of the Apostles, is a kind of um, early history. It's a kind of history of the early community. Now again, you know, history doesn't mean reportage doesn't mean you're going around writing it out in a notebook. So you've got episodes which are recorded to you, and whoever wrote Luke, let's call him Luke, Luke is the guy who also writes Acts. And he couches all this into an early account, and if there are incidents there about, he knows they happened, and he knows what went on, but he doesn't have the actual text of, you know, you can't imagine that, you know, well, we've got the text of what Peter said on this occasion. He puts words onto the lips of Peter. And that's perfectly an acceptable thing to do. I mean, you think about writing, writing early English history, and you put a, a text onto the lips of somebody. You're not suggesting they actually said those exact words, but you are saying that was the message that they spoke on that occasion. And that happens as well in Acts. And then the final book is called Revelation. Hi, come right in. The final book is called Revelation. And originally this was something that was written to different Christian communities around modern day Turkey, Asia Minor as we called it. So there were seven little churches there in different towns or cities and they were written to them at a time of persecution, and so they're trying to kind of, you know, womp up the troops, as it were. They're visionary. They give you incredible visions of the end of time, and this is what's going to happen. Now, I always say to people, you know, signs of al-Dijal, you know, list them out. You know, my advice is very simple. You meet a guy coming down the road with one triangular eye in the middle of his forehead, you got trouble, you know? you know? Wait and see. Now, in the same way, in the book of Revelation, you've got incredible visions of all sorts of seven-headed beasts and all this kind of stuff. Well, it doesn't mean, you know, that you were going to meet them walking down the street. These are symbolic language trying to put across a message to that particular, those particular communities. 
just as, you know, there's more stuff written about Al-Dijjal and his coming than there is written about serious stuff. So in the same way, people like to build fantasies around images in the book of, of, um, of Revelation. Allahu <laughs> Alam. Well, it says, it says John of Patmos. Whether it, there was a person called John of Patmos, whether he was the author, God knows best. Um, what do we know about him? We don't know, except he had a pretty vivid imagination. He likes strange mushrooms. Yeah, could be. <laughs> Patmos is an island off the, off, in the Mediterranean, off the Greek coast. Um, <coughs> but people get fascinated about this kind of stuff, just like Al-Dijjal, as it were. When I was a student um, studying Christian theology and, and Islamics, um, some people were a little bit um, concerned about this. And then my library, we got a new library card, and my library number was 666. <laughs> now in the, book of, in the book of Revelation, it says this is the number of the demonic beast, you see. And so there were certain people who were keeping their distance from me from then on. You know, it's, this is visionary stuff. It, you're not supposed to be meeting these guys walking down the street. Anybody want to come jumping in? Because we're heading toward the end here, and we're going to change tack completely after... When did the who were the authors? Allahu I mean, it may be uh, one Peter... I mean, a theory is put forward that probably can be traced back to Peter, but then polished by a scribe. Um, and then you've got, you know, you've got a kind of community. Um, James, Jude, coming from the Jerusalem church is about all we can say. You've got three that bear the name of John. Now, I mean, the scholars say that they're coming out of the same community that produced this fourth gospel. Because they use a similar terminology and they have a certain, you know, theological style and so on. So community letters really um, but again you know these things are not worth going to the stake over you know if, if somebody comes forward and says well all the evidence is this was written by a man called Fred well, yep yeah, fine you know where does that take us tell me the message show me what it says but if we don't even know who wrote Revelation no how can we how can it be added to the Bible well, it can be added in be, to, you know, because <laughs> it can be added in because the the leaders of the early Christian community thought that it was um, an authentic addition to the accepted scriptures, but it's manifestly not on the same level as these lads. It's manifestly not on the same level as here. So, you know, you've got different degrees of, of importance, let's say, within the library of the New Testament. But it always has to be read with a knowledge of an understanding of the, the context and the purpose for which it was written. Please. Uh, is it true that some of the writing in Revelation is similar in style to some of the writings in the Old Testament, like some of the passages of Daniel. Yes. So that would, that would give credence to it being part of, um, accepted as part of the of it, scripture? It would, it would ring familiar, let's say. Mm. For anybody who knew the book of Daniel, Daniel, Daniel is the same sort of writing. You know, it's visions of, that are not supposed to be taken, as it were, Polaroid camera-wise. And Revelation is of the same sort of genre, as we would say. So if you were reading the two, you would say, mm, yeah, there's something here. Now, uh, that lends to its authenticity uh, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, give it, it's not a basis for its acceptability. That basis lies not just at that level, but with the community of the Christian church, the Christian community. And they're the ones who say in or out.
Right, we now have eight minutes to the designated moment of lunch. So you've asked for it, so you get another eight minutes of punishment. No, we had lunch at half twelve. Oh, so oh, in that case, we're over lunch. So we'll break for lunch right now. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Uh, we will resume afterwards when the master says go. And uh, we'll then go and look at uh, the person of Jesus and how Christians have got themselves into the state they've got into about Jesus. Can I have yeah. one more question? Yes. When you say the community. Yes. When you say the community. Yeah. Um, I mean, community is composed of lots of individuals, isn't it? Yes. So, what do you mean by that? What I mean uh, are is... Are there some leaders in the community or... Yes. Intellectuals? Uh, from the... Be- name to them? Well, from the beginning, the Christian community forms, as it were, leadership officers. We could call them bishops. Uh, those leaders meet together and they have the responsibility of taking these kind of decisions. So they would be bishops and scholars who would meet and thrash things out. Um, but that's who they are. It's not a kind of popular referendum, as it were. But they would be bishops and scholars. Yeah, but who would have appointed them? Uh, is there a selection? The community. So they would be like a democratic sort of... So. <laughs> More or less, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not easy to say. Mm. But you do have leaders being elected by the local community. And then, you know, you get, as it were, local imams, yeah. you know, get together and they say, well, he's a bigger wig than the rest of us. Okay. So, you know, we'll give him the job of being the mufti or whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's fairly embryonic at that stage. Mm. But it is understood that this is part of the kind of structure of the early Christian community. See, Jesus has an inner group of 12 who go around with him. And he chooses them because of their their character, their quality, their whatever, and then kind of, you know, teaches them and leads them on. And when Judas drops out, they say, well, we need somebody else. So what do they do? They gather the other 11 together. They gather the wider community. They go through a period of fasting and prayer, and then they make a decision. And that's the kind of model. It's like the model of, of, of Peter and Paul and you know Jewish or non-Jewish practices. That's the kind of model. So you don't have a kind of imamate type model but you have something rather more than a kind of khalifat model in which, you know, money does play a role, as it were. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Lunch! Hooray!